Well, good Monday morning. We have a big subject to talk about today. Now, I want to remind you that we record these very, very early. In fact, as I'm recording this, we've just passed Columbus Day. So you're getting this a month plus later. And I'm well aware that events in the world, um, we have now have a war in Israel, we have a war in Ukraine. We don't know when we record these, what the world's gonna be like when they're being shown. So just keep that in mind. Regardless, all of my life, I've heard about the Antichrist. I've read so many books, listened to so many lectures and seminars talking about the Antichrist, dystopian books and movies and such. If you don't know what that means, it means negative forward looking. In other words, the world's gonna become a desert. It's gonna become Hunger Games. It's gonna become zombie land. It's gonna become something like that. And that's not just America, but the entire world. That's a dystopian way of thinking. And those movies, TV shows, and books have ruled the roost for a lot of the last, really, two decades. But that's not new. Uh, this, this is a cycle. And every time that struggles hit, whether it's depression, war, um, a, a worldwide virus, shall we say, things break out in books and preachers get on TV and they talk about the Antichrist. And they get people so terrified. I cannot tell you the number of people. I have had write me or come to my office or you know, give me a call if they know my number and say, I'm so terrified because these signs are now occurring. This must be the end of time. If you ever want to spend a little bit of fun, just go on to Google and search the people and how many times we were convinced it was the end of the world. You can also do that on Wikipedia. You'll find there ever since Paul of the the New Testament, that Paul. We have had people say, it is just around the corner. It's any second now, look at the signs. And they will often use the word antichrist. With all of the, the tomes out there on the antichrist, you might think, well, we must have quite a lot of information about him in scripture, but we do not. We don't. He's only mentioned four times in the entire Bible and those all exist in the tiny books of First John and second John, that's it, that's all. In John chapter two, verse 18, John chapter two, verse 22, John chapter four, verses two and three, and in second John, verse seven, there are no chapters in second John, second John, verse seven. He's referred to as antichrist. Now, there's not a lot of information there. There really isn't, I'll let you read it because we have to keep this tight. And I'm sorry I'm having to talk so fast. It seems that whatever Paul, uh, I'm sorry, John was referring to in these passages was already occurring. In fact, he says that, and that it was spreading throughout the world while he was there. And it also seems to be referring to plural, not single actors. <coughs> so it's not the Antichrist in the sense that there is one person, but rather Antichrist in that this is an attitude and this is a decision, and this is a claim that is made by people. Uh, not quite Satan, but people. It's not a singular historical figure. It never was in John. It never was in scripture. So people love mysteries and they love thinking they figured things out by doing their math right and, and checking the maps and, and deciding that this word must work with that word. That's where we get churches like Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, others who have decided they found the secrets. There, there aren't the secrets. They're, they're, they're in front of all of us. And the scholarship, you can do the scholarship. Uh, if you don't know how to do it yourselves, you can find the preponderance of scholarship. But regardless, they will add in other enigmatic figures to try to flesh out this story. They will go uh, to Jesus' warning in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13 about false messiahs, false Christ. And they'll, they'll throw that in there. Then they'll go to Paul in 2 Thessalonians where he talks about the man of lawless, lawlessness who is currently being restrained but will soon break through that restraint and run through the world. And then they add uh, Daniel because Daniel is really two books and it was 
put together 167 AD, and I know that that's going to drive a lot of people crazy. I used to believe it was an ancient book written in Babylon as well. But the scholarship, the facts just do not support that. I really wish it did because I have a whole sermon series I did on it and it made perfect sense until I found out that pretty much all of my assumptions were wrong. And the more I dug, the more facts I uncovered, the more I had to throw those sermons away. It was put together around 167 AD as a um, diatribe, a polemic against a particular Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was uh, really one of the most evil people that you will have ever walked on the face of the earth. And that's saying something because we tend to produce some evil people. But it's also two books. Um, and there are additional chapters, by the way, we don't have. They were in the Septuagint, but considered not important enough or something to be added later. Like the tale of Susanna, you know, there's um, Bell and the Dragon. Those were all parts of Daniel. But the first part of Daniel is a story, he, a heroic figure he is. He withstands this, withstands that. And you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well. But the second part is just this wildly obtuse set of prophecies. Um, and so when, it, when something is very hard to understand and may not have a sim simple or any explanation, people jump on it and then form it into their own clay thing and say, behold, you know, the little horn of Daniel is also the Antichrist and is also Paul's man of lawlessness. And then of course, of course, they run to the book of Revelation where uh, the majority of them will say the beast of the sea must be the Antichrist. Well, there's no must to it. It doesn't must anything. Do all of these characters and situations and ideas belong together? Probably not, almost certainly not, but let's talk about it. First, you need to know that the vast majority of people who know their Hebrew and know their Syriac and know their Chaldean and know their Aramaic, uh, Aramaic and know their Greek and know the cultures believe that this is referring to a type of people that are common in all generations, not a singular person. That's all added in. And I know that's we're drilling down deep through layers of concrete in some of you right now because you've had this pounded into you so much that you see it everywhere. The term antichrist seems to have been made as a way to refer to evil people that were as evil as Satan, but without his power, but they put on airs of power even as superior to that of Christ. The first Christian to write and used the word antichrist other than John, was an Essene who converted to Christianity and he wrote a book called Ode to Solomon, uh, Odes rather, Odes of Solomon. And in that book, he said the antichrist is a, uh, is a figure and the figure that he used was a dragon and Christ overcomes the dragon. By the way, that's very common metaphoric language from book of Revelation through this book, all the way through St. George and the Dragon in English mythology. Uh, the first Christian that we know by name and, and by reputation to write of the Antichrist was Polycarp. Most of you, if you've studied any religious history at all, know Polycarp, very well-known name, lived a long life, 69 AD to 155 AD. He warned the Philippians that everybody, everybody who preached false doctrine was Antichrist. And that was the norm in early Christianity. I have to stress this. In early Christianity, nobody thought of this as one figure, one political figure, one military figure. No, it was considered anybody who spoke against Christ, who tried to claim superiority to Christ, or who tried to claim that they were Christ, were antichrist. Every age has these people. And Polycarp made that plain. But there are other names that, if, again, if you know any church history at all, you know some of these names. Irenaeus is another one that you absolutely know. He was the first to try to decode the book of Revelation. And that was an interesting little thing he tried there. He wanted to get the names of the Antichrist by playing with the new numbers, you know, like 666 and, uh, or 667 in some of the earlier manuscripts. Throws off the math. 
uh, where they're, he's trying to decode and say, well, a Hebrew for this letter sounds like this number. And sometimes Hebrew letters are used as numbers. That part is accurate. And then he adds all this up. And so he came up with a list of names. I'm not even going to give them. All of them were, um, or he said were or would be officials in a Roman empire. So he was trying to shove all of this into that box. And by the way, the book of Revelation was not generally accepted in a canon by the time of Irenaeus and would not be generally accepted in the canon of scripture. In other words, as a book that should belong in the Bible for another hundred years in the West and for many, many, many more years in the East. In fact, the Eastern Orthodox Church still rarely uses the book, except that before Easter, they do read it in one sitting all the way through in public. That's about all they use it for. Uh, and early writers, uh, way after Irenaeus, were still saying it shouldn't be in the Bible. It's too confusing, just causes divisions, and there doesn't seem to be much we can learn from it. Well, I think we can learn from it. But whenever you try to match historical stuff to the book of Revelation, you've really, you've gone off the wrong end of the diving board. You're just going to hit the concrete. Um, it is, as Randy Harris put it, God has a team, Satan has a team, God's team wins, pick a team. That's the book of Revelation. Moving on, another book was written around the time of Irenaeus by an unknown author. Uh, he said that the Antichrist was both Belial and Nero. Well, a lot of people thought Nero was the Antichrist, and he certainly was Antichrist. And so he was probably someone that John would have called Antichrist. Belial is either a name for Satan, it's used that way sometimes, or one of the chief most powerful demons that followed Satan. Either way, uh, this writer uses Antichrist for both of them. And what does that tell us? That tells us that even hundreds of years after the Bible, they still were not pointing to one person or even one species because Antichrist could be demons or they could be human beings. Interestingly enough, both early Christians and Jews believed and taught and wrote that a Messiah, most of them would write false Messiah, some of the Jewish people said the real Messiah, will come from the tribe of Dan. And there is biblical support for that. Um, even though Jesus came up through Judah, it's according to how you read some things and fight for them, I guess. But whoever this guy is who comes up, and it will be a guy, sorry ladies, uh, you don't get to be the false messiah. So you're off the hook. But uh, this guy's gonna come out of the tribe of uh, Dan and he's gonna rebuild the temple on Temple Mount, where they're fighting now uh, when I record this, uh, and where rockets are flying overhead. And from there, he will rule for three and a half years. Why three and a half years? Because Daniel used a metaphorical, symbolic way of time, and he referred to weeks and seven weeks and weeks of weeks and sevens of sevens and half a week. And then, and people have been trying to cut that pie in a way that fits their lifetime and the people they know ever since. So that's why. Anyway, uh, this false messiah also has been alternately identified with the beast of the earth or the beast of the sea in the book of Revelation. Confused? You should be, because this is a mess. It's a complete mess. They've taken what Paul, uh, well, what Paul said too, but what John said about don't join in the spirit of the world, which is antichrist. And they've turned it into this apocalyptic fright fest. It's as if every Sunday is Halloween in some churches where death is coming, demons are coming, the end of the world is coming, everything is dark and horrible. You know something? Um, you could turn your church into a Halloween costume store and probably have just as much impact upon the planet as you're doing now. We, we don't live in Halloween. We live in Advent, which isn't it nice that that started now? Origen, one of the greatest leaders of the early church, love him or hate him, and most people who know his work do both, but love and hate him because he really thought about a lot of stuff and everything he thought about he wrote. And he did not write in ways that Western people, although technically he was Western, can read today and go, oh, I get your point, that's very valid. But I, I enjoy reading him, but other times I'll look at him and go, uh, get an editor? Um, think 
regardless, he said it referred to evil men, some of whom do, so, do such evil in league with Satan that they become Satan-like. And again, the book of Daniel, that wasn't even thrown in here for discussion until St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the middle of the fourth century. And he was searching Daniel for clues about the coming of Christ because he was thinking, shouldn't he be back by now? Which is what every generation since Jesus has thought. And they've all searched for clues. A lot of them do go to Daniel or Ezekiel or Revelation or hodgepodge, grabbing verses from everywhere, trying to find something. And then a lot of them just have their own visions, dreams, and ideas, and they throw those out. There are others like Athanasius of Alexandria who used the term Antichrist to attack anybody who disagreed with them. Now, Athanasius was a Trinitarian. <clears throat> so am I. I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I believe that they were eternal, co-eternal, co-existent, that the, all of them received the name of God, um, that there's no stacking or order between them. However, I'm the first to admit there's not a whole lot in the Bible that you can use to, to shove forward that as solid, but I, I think there's enough for me. For others, there is not. And for one of the others that there was not was a man named Arius, a very important bishop. And Athanasius and Arius fought in a big, very public battle, um, not physically, although there was some physicality. I guess it's being shown <clears throat> in December, if I correctly Remember, hang on, <clears throat> leaves are falling, mold is here. <clears throat> I do apologize. Um, anyway, Advent is here, right. <clears throat> there is a story, and it probably didn't happen, but I like it anyway, someone tell the story, that St. Nicholas got so mad at, at um, Arius for not agreeing with the Trinity that he punched him in the face. And so if your Santa Claus is knocking out heretics, I mean, come on, that's gonna make you like Santa Claus. Now, was Arius a heretic? I don't think so, no. A heretic means somebody who divides the church and he wasn't trying to do that. He was applying his logic and he did not see the Trinity the way that mainstream Orthodox Christians do today. To me, that's not a reason to kick you out of the church. I cannot see why in the world we would want to do that. But he said, he, Arius is a harbinger of the Antichrist. Well, there was a very well-known speaker who spoke so well that they called him Golden Mouth, Christostom. John Christostom said, let us not therefore inquire into these things about the Antichrist. Because he said, when you start using that label, you spread only fear, slander, and disruption. I like John. That was good old, good old John. Jerome in about 400 AD got it right in my opinion. He said, he that is not of Christ is antichrist. So there's no question that, and I know I'm going long, we are wrapping it up, we're gonna land the plane here. There is no question that Christian thought, at least through Pope Gregory I in 597 AD, believed that men would arise that would elevate themselves to become the equal of God or the true God, and that they would rule, if not from a temple in Jerusalem, a metaphorical temple on earth or in heaven. Later, Protestants would come along and say, hey, you know what, I bet the Antichrist is the Pope. Of course they would. And, and he's the beast of the earth, or he's the beast of the sea, and they fight that out among themselves. And there's gonna be tribulation before, after, during, and oh my goodness. What they do is they build skyscrapers on top of cobwebs. Drill down and see what the evidence is and you're gonna be shocked that 99% of it is missing because it never was. You build a cloud upon cloud upon cloud and then drop a rock on it, the clouds aren't gonna hold it. These arguments are clouds. Well, there's no, there's no biblical support for me to be, yell the term antichrist at human beings, but it is a warning. It is a warning, don't be like the world. Remember who your ruler is. Stay strong to the end. There will be opposition and false Christ. There will be many who want you to substitute their religion for Christ, their ideology for Christ, their politics for Christ, their heroes for Christ, their churches for Christ. They want you to substitute their stuff to where Jesus is shoved off and just brought in every so often 
like a, a model on a t-shirt to back up the current movement of the day. Live your life knowing that your decisions can make you more like Christ or less like him, anti-Christ. That doesn't mean that when you sin that you're an antichrist. No, just keep in mind, whatever is not of Christ is antichrist. We need to be of Christ. May everything we say, may everything we do, may everything we believe be more like Jesus. God bless you in this season of Advent. We love you. Thank you for supporting our safe harbor, for subscribing, which is amazing. Hitting the bell, hitting the like, that helps us so much. And for those of you that give so that we can last one more year doing this, thank you. God bless you. And may I be one of the 500th to say, yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs>